Good morning and thank you for joining us, uh, Press. Welcome to our premier inaugural series of virtual press, uh, virtual press conferences. This is for the Green Party of the United States 2020 Presidential Nominating Convention. This is an experiment for us and probably for most of you. So before this gets started, I'll turn it over to our moderator. I will uh, want to go over a few points. First of all, as the press is muted when you come in, I'm just letting press in so we can minimize extra noise and distraction. Uh, please also rename yourself with your full name and media outlet if you can. Uh, once we get started, the moderator will introduce each speaker in turn, after which you will each uh, get a chance to do your opening speech. And then after that, the moderator will introduce, uh, will take it, open the floor for questions and answers. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, press please use the raise hand function or you can type a question into the chat area. Uh, if that doesn't work, just wave your hand and we'll hope to see you, we'll, we'll spot you. When the moderator calls on you, you will be asked to unmute. You get a prompt and then you can unmute on your end and you'll remain unmuted for your question and any follow up. Uh, in one case, we had a person in the last conference who uh, audio didn't work even though he was unmuted. So we may just read a question posted in the chat for the sake of convenience. Also note, if we run into a problem with bandwidth, poor connection or something, you might be dropped either by us or the application, one of the hazards of uh, virtual meetings. Also wanna remind everyone more information about the Green Party, the convention and where you can watch it and other public events can be found in your press packet and schedule. You can go to gp.org slash live, check our Facebook Green Party of the United States Facebook page, also on YouTube and we'll offer on the uh, Green Party website, live English captioning and uh, simultaneous ASL interpretation. I'll now turn this over to our moderator, who is Laura Wells. She's a member of the Green Party of California. She's been a Green since 1992, when they first became ballot qualified in California. Laura has run as a congressional candidate and for the offices of state controller and governor on the platform of taxing the rich, reforming Prop 13 and instituting public banks. She has one daughter, who's a musician and she lives in Oakland, California. Laura, thank you for moderating and I'm gonna turn this over to you. Take it away, Laura. <clears throat> thank you, Holly. And I'm very happy to introduce candidates for local and state office. Contrary to what many people believe, Greens do run local. Since it became ballot qualified in states starting in the 1990s, the Green Party has been by far the most successful progressive alternative political party in the country. The candidates in this press conference are carrying on the tradition of running for and quite possibly winning their seats. The entire character of a council or a commission changes when even one person who is not sold out to developers and corporations has a seat at the table. Look at Richmond, California fighting against the Chevron Corporation and look at Seattle fighting other mega corporations. So let's get started and we'll do this in alphabetical order. So let's start with William Bortfield. And to introduce him, he's a Southern progressive running to be the Louisiana Public Service Commissioner uh, for District 1, the LPSC is mainly a utility regulatory body as defined in Louisiana's state constitution. He was born and raised around New Orleans and William is ready to bring efficiency and transparency to the LPSC. Welcome, William Bortfield. Hi, thank you. Uh, so as she uh, already said, my name is William Bortfield and I'm running for Louisiana Public Service Commissioner in District 1. Uh, I was raised in Gretna, Louisiana, which is a suburb right outside of New Orleans. Uh, I went to the New Orleans Military Maritime Academy and my, my senior year of high school, I decided that I was going to run for office. I ran for mayor of Gretna in 2017 and although I was unsuccessful, it sparked a flame that I found a passion within myself. Given the current incumbent Eric Skirmetta and his donations uh, to his campaign, for example, I believe that I will be the only person to run against him and his campaign account already has $300,000. Uh, the donations go as, as, as such, uh, and I just wanna make sure I have the numbers right because I don't wanna get this wrong. $19,000 from Atmos Energy, a gas uh, utility company that he regulates, $15,000 from Intergy, which is an electric uh, 
provider in Louisiana that he regulates, 14,000 from AEP and Clico, and those are both utility companies. And then he also receives donations from other utility companies that the commission uh, regulates, not necessarily within his district. So what we see with him is a coziness with these utility companies. Eric Skirmetta slashed net metering rates. Uh, and for those who aren't familiar with net metering rates, uh, basically what it is is when somebody has solar panels on their house, they can uh, sell their stuff back to the grid when they produce more than they use. And there's three different types. You have uh, retail value, which is whatever the electric company sells it to you at. You have wholesale value, which is whatever it is, uh, whatever it costs to build or make. And then you have avoided cost value, which is basically a percentage of what it costs to make to save the private utility company the most amount of money. Uh, three things I will do when I am elected as commissioner in district one, I am going to push to expand grants for solar panel home installations for citizens. I'm going to restore or fight to restore net metering rates back to full retail. And something that people don't usually hear is I'm going to push for the deregulation of the electric market in Louisiana. Not to say that we're going to stop regulating, but what we want to do is allow more competition to come into the area on the electric provider side to break up the monopolies that we see, see within the state and that uh, I would say leads to our high rates across our state in uh, electricity, gas, and water. Uh, and thank you for having me here again. And I will give it back to uh, Miss Laura. Okay. Well, thank you, William. Our next uh, candidate will be Michael Kundit, and he's a beyond organic farmer, a musician, and a community change agent. Michael is the chair of the Utah Permaculture Collective, a co-founder of the Salt Lake City Air Protectors, and the agricultural co-director of the Krishna Food Forest and Farm. He is running for Salt Lake County Mayor as Utah's only Green Party candidate in 2020. Thank you so much, Laura, and thank you for putting this all together and having me on today. <clears throat> uh, when the Green Party of Utah asked me to run, it definitely appealed uh, because I'm doing a lot of the work that I believe the world uh, needs already. And I believe that through the political transformation that this country needs, we're able to better elevate um, the solutions that are really all around us. Um, I think it's really important that more and more political people that choose to run are ecologically educated and know what it's going to take to heal the soils, protect the water, protect the air, and also really encourage um, a culture of, of mutual aid, a culture of taking care of each other, a, a culture of resiliency. Uh, running for county mayor is a really big seat. This is the capital county, serves over 1.1 million people. And it's a really amazing opportunity to be able to pull um, Salt Lake County together and share a vision of what I like to call the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. Uh, so much would change for us when it comes to social justice, political transparency, and ecological health if we really take the time to focus on the foundations for what creates a truly healthy uh, a really healthy world and healthy people, which is really founded in the way we interact with our environment. Uh, coming from the background of an urban farmer and gardener, I've been advocating for those types of solutions for the last nine years. I've started nonprofits and I work uh, diligently to help people learn how to grow their own food. Uh, I believe Salt Lake County could produce uh, 40 to 50 percent of its own calories. Uh, we have a big heritage, a pioneer heritage, so to speak, here in the county, uh, where we used to produce almost all of our own food um, as uh, Mormons and even further back with the indigenous people um, of this uh, valley. And so I want to bring a resurgence to that and, and help people realize that if we are resilient and self-sufficient, if we're able to feed ourselves and take care of each other and untap the potential of our communities by more intentionally coming together and sharing resources uh, for a brighter world, um, this vision, uh, by running for such a large seat and for putting my heart into this, um, I believe those uh, those visions, those programs, those um, the, the way that we're creating those changes are going to be elevated and it's a no it's a no lose scenario it's a great opportunity to be running for the green party i believe that um, the two party system is unable to produce the kinds of systemic changes that we need in the world 
And so the energy of this campaign is meant to create change now, um, regardless of the outcome, and also to be a pioneer for more millennials, more progressives, more people, even with tattoos, to step into the field and say there's a better vision out here and we need to be authentic and we need to be uh, transforming the political system, getting money out of it, bringing transparency back. I'm running against a, an incumbent centrist Democrat um, that just doesn't have the capacity to make the bold changes that we need in the world. So thank you for this opportunity for uh, having me here today. Well, thank you, Michael Kundik. Uh, and our next one, our next candidate is Jake Tonkel. And he's a biomedical engineer running for city council in San Jose, California. He's a Peace Corps volunteer and an organizer for socially and environmentally responsible community develop investment, including public banking. He has been endorsed by the local AFL-CIO Labor Council, the California Nurses Association, San Jose Firefighters Association, and the San Jose Teachers Association in his race. Welcome, Jake Tonkel. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, this is really exciting time. I mean, we're in the middle of a, a net global pandemic and we're still campaigning on progressive values as a way to show the community what perhaps we were missing. So again, my name is Jake Tonkel. I'm running for city council here in San Jose, California, specifically for District 6, which covers the west side of San Jose and is particularly impacted by our development and growth, especially coming up where we have Google creating one of its largest new campuses right on the edge of the district. And then as we discuss how high-speed rail for California makes its way into San Jose and then into the Bay Area. Uh, so we have really centered this progressive coalition, you know, like you said, gathering support from many of our local labor organizations, um, the Green Party, and, and even many democratic clubs in Santa Clara County. We've centered this coalition around equity for the city of San Jose and for the district. Uh, as a city that has almost 94% zoned for single family residential, we're one of the largest but most sprawled cities in the country. And as we develop, especially around some of these new projects, gentrification and displacement are becoming more and more of an issue that we are really failing to rise to the occasion of and prevent. Um, we have in San Jose, the fastest growing inequality of any city in the country. And in Santa Clara County, which we reside in, uh, home to the largest gender pay gap and the largest wage theft of any county in the country as well. So we are continually struggling with kind of the epitome of inequity with tech and then low wage workers where four out of every, four low wage jobs exist in San Jose for every one low wage housing unit. We're really struggling to make sure people can stay here. And until we make changes to represent people, uh, implement publicly funded elections, things like ranked choice voting, overhaul our community to, um, engagement process so that we can get more voices at the table when we decide what development looks like, we're gonna continue to struggle as a city. San Jose uh, sits in a, a space where we don't even talk about uh, Democrat versus Republican very often because the council is uh, generally and the Bay Area generally very democratically run, but we do have labor versus chamber as the divide for city council. Uh, right now we are on the edge where the business uh, development sector has six votes versus five votes that are progressive in labor. And we're up against uh, you know, one of the more conservative members on council. This is the opportunity for us not only to change how District 6 and its residents interact with the office and get to have a voice uh, on city council, but for the city as a whole, flipping this seat will have massive implications for how we move forward, for how equity is pushed uh, at city hall. And I'm extremely excited to be able to continue that conversation through the next few months on to November. Thank you, Jake Tonko. <clears throat> now, next is Sherry Wells. She's running for state representative in the 27th district in Michigan. She's a 32-year resident of Ferndale, Michigan. Sherry is a community activist and was elected to the Charter Revision Commission of Ferndale, sharing it for two years. She ran for the State Board of Education, 
attending its meetings and board meetings of school districts in Oakland County and across the state. Sherry Wells. Good morning. Uh, the community activist part was given me by one of our Ferndale business owners when he was introducing me to his wife, and I thought, I'll take that. And it has worked out to be an excellent advantage. My state rep office runs along Eight Mile Road, made famous by M&M, but Ferndale also has a distinction of having uh, Affirmations, which is a lead LGBT organization here in Michigan. I can walk one house to the right and I can see its front door. Uh, the seven communities that I'll be running in are all familiar with me. I've been exploring this for a year and a half, attending their city council and commission and township board meetings, school district meetings before and since I was running for the State Board of Education. I learned so much about education in Michigan that I wanted to use it somewhere and state representative is a natural because they're supposed to be funding it according to the Michigan Constitution. What is also, there are so many things tied in with education. I have a four leaf clover symbol I'm running with. So it's public education, it's public transit, it's prison reform and it's protecting families and all of that is so intertwined. I did some research and Michigan spends $34,000 per prisoner per year. For that amount of money, someone can attend University of Michigan tuition, books and room and board for a year or they can get one of two years of skilled trades training. Both two years would be for less than what we pay for a prisoner. And the amount of money we have per student is like less than a third of what we pay for prisoners. So we definitely need to have some reorientation of those things. What I have here with these quote lower offices is we have two people, two Greens running for county commission in those the same districts. One of them's one of his county commission district is totally within my state rep district so we can run together people we see two greens on the ballot in those lower offices and the other person is three square miles she's a disabled veteran and she has much she can talk about she's done a line by line study of the county commission budget we have excellent candidates and we are working together this is what i call a farm team so that ultimately we can we can get elected at this level and we can keep moving upwards to do more than just raise issues but also get elected. I'm also working this time with having our candidates across the whole state go after endorsements, Sierra Club, union endorsements. If it does nothing else, it will tell them for probably the first time. So I respected the endorsements that I heard from another one of our candidates who got the AFL-CIO. I'm working on them and they need to know we're here. They need to know that we're on the same side and they're not going to find that anywhere else. I'm also working with our Peace Action and their national organization person came around a couple of years ago and he said, you need to consider green candidates, especially for Congress, correct? And I'm sitting there saying, this is what I'm doing here, letting them know that the Green Party exists and it is an option. So as you can tell, I am just excited about the possibilities that we can do at these local offices. Thank you, Sherry Wells. And our next candidate is Ann Wilcox, and she's a long-term DC statehood green member who is running for the DC city council at large seat. She's a lawyer, and a longtime community activist and has served as a school board member in DC. She was also active with GPAC's Green Party Peace Action Committee for many years at the national level. Welcome, Ann Wilcox. You need to be unmuted. Wilcox. I'm going to ask you, okay, Anne, if you can mute yourself. Okay, um, thank you. Sorry, I had muted myself, so there we go. Okay, 
Thank you very much, Laura and Holly and everyone for pulling this together. Um, I'm Ann Wilcox. I'm running for a city council at large seat in Washington, DC. Um, it's, an open, it's an open seat this year because one of our members is, is stepping aside. So I, along with uh, three other ballot candidates and a number of independent candidates are running for the seat. Um, I'm a longtime member of the statehood party and back in the 1970s and 80s, we founded the statehood party to push for statehood after our home rule, which is limited home rule, was given to us by Congress. And we did have city council members with the statehood party back in those days. Then in the 1990s, the statehood party merged with the Greens, so we're now called the statehood Green Party and have continued to maintain our ballot status through this entire time. Uh, we haven't gotten back on the city council, but we have had two uh, school board members, and I was one of those school board members who served for a, a four-year term, and we've had a number of uh, neighborhood commissioners who are all statehood Greens, so we've had some success on the local level. Um, my own background, I'm uh, from Ohio originally, another Midwesterner, but I came to Washington, D.C. as a student, really liked uh, D.C., and went to law school here. So I'm a longtime public interest lawyer. I've done, you know, landlord-tenant uh, law, worked with protesters quite a bit. I'm active with the National Lawyers Guild, which is another fellow traveler organization for the Greens, um, and uh, have been a longtime community activist, as well as serving on the school board, as I, as I mentioned. Um, the uh, program we're running on this year, the platform, is of course center statehood because DC is making some progress toward achieving statehood. We had a vote in the House of Representatives just a couple of weeks ago, which is the first time the statehood bill has ever passed in the Congress. Now, of course, the Senate will be an uphill battle and then it had, the bill would have to get signed by the president, uh, which of course this president would never do, but there is some hope for the future. Um, the Statehood Green Party is also our progressive party for DC. So of course we oppose gentrification, which is becoming a huge problem here, as well as in places like San Jose. Um, we're for affordable housing, uh, more health, health equity. Uh, we propose a Green New Deal platform, which is energy conservation and all of those issues. And basically opposing the rampant development, which most of our uh, political power Power brokers are very much behind developers and they're funded by developers. So, uh, for example, this week I put out a press release calling for some of that development money, which really is subsidized by the city council, to be shifted over to funding public housing repairs because public housing is falling into disrepair and children are living in you know, conditions of mold and vermin and so forth. So we need to put more money into our public housing and shift money away from some of those development projects. So that's kind of what we're, what we're about, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ann Wilcox. Okay, well now we're at the uh, part of our press conference where we will be open to questions. And if you can raise your hand, and uh, I think Holly will unmute you or ask you to uh, unmute yourself. Questions could also be entered into the chat. Um, so, Holly, I think this is where you'll at. Yes, um, yeah, if you have a question, um, if, if there aren't any, I will mention we had, we, we had tons of really excellent candidates to pick from. Uh, we got very good candidates to show up here. And um, I wanna mention that the Coordinated Campaign Committee will be hosting a telethon featuring these and more candidates coming up late August or early September. And this is to raise funds for people running for local and state offices. And so keep, so keep your eyes on Facebook. Um, I do want to mention, um, since we had a number of these, we're almost at the half hour point. So since I don't see hands raised, I would like to raise a question because I know it's been a lot of people's minds. Uh, what happened in Minneapolis uh, in this month uh, and what is going on throughout the country in regard to police brutality and racism has, of course, started a big uh, public conversation and uh, perhaps a moment of change. Very quickly, I'd like to hear from uh, the candidates because this is something that can affect your areas quite, uh, you know, and you'll have some impact or can have some impact on this, uh, uh, on this issue. I'd like to hear quickly what ideas you have on, on the situation. And I can unmute, I'll ask all of the candidates to unmute if you can. <clears throat> well, I could start. Let me let me start in DC because we have Black Lives Matter Plaza emblazoned on one of our streets right next to the White House. 
And that was sort of a, a gesture by our mayor who doesn't have complete unfettered control over the police in DC. If there is, there is an obscure law that it would allow President Trump to federalize our local police if, to maintain order in the nation's capital. Um, but, and our police uh, force thinks they're a model police force because they deal with protests a lot. A lot of people have been here for marches and so forth, but they're not a perfect police force. We have a very high level of stop and frisk in our community, which so we, the council is required that they maintain statistics about stop and frisk. Uh, they're even hassling people who stay late overnight at the Black Lives Matter Plaza. So there's actually been some unnecessary arrests there. Um, and the other point I would mention, so obviously we're having these same discussions about defunding the police budget in our in our city. And I would just mention real quickly that we're talking a lot about the health equity issues too in, a, in light of the COVID crisis. So thank you. Ferndale and the state rep uh, office that I'm running for is located, as I said, along Eight Mile Road. And it has been gratifying to see even more than usual the number of suburban people, white suburban people out on the streets of all ages, six feet apart and wearing our masks, but we're out there. And the, uh, a local organization has just helped spread out 2,000 Black Lives Matters, Matter lawn signs. And that's just, I looked at the list of where they were distributing yesterday to pick which where I was going to go. And they're all over my state rep district. So that is gratifying that the white suburbanites, as well as the uh, black area, the ghettoized black area in, in the state rep district also had a march. And it's, it's, I hope this will finally be what makes it happen or stop yeah. happening. <laughs> I believe, uh, uh, and this is something when I ran for mayor in 2017 in high school, criminal justice reform was a big thing that I ran on because Gretna is, uh, you're 14 times more likely to get arrested in Gretna than in uh, Ferguson, despite mm -hmm. having 14 times uh, less violence. Uh, but uh, it, it's, it's really, it's tough to watch because as someone who's only 21 years of age, uh, the Rodney King incident happened before I, you know, set almost seven, eight years before I was born. This is something that's been going on for hundreds of years. Um, I, I think the biggest thing, and this is something that I've been telling my fellow uh, white progressives, is that it's important that we give uh, minorities the ability to, to voice their concerns without us, you know, so much trying to take the center light. And that's mainly what I've been trying to do, because as a white male, you know, I do have privileges that, you know, many others do not have in this country. But I do know that given that I have a, you know, that privilege, it would be, you know, stupid not to use it to try to destroy it. Um, so, and that's what I try to tell, you know, a lot of my younger, you know, white friends growing up is, yeah, you have the white privilege, use it to destroy it. Um, but also allow when, you know, uh, Latinx, uh, you know, African-American, any minority, you know, community that has been oppressed by white people, which is almost every community, you know, throughout the world over, you know, millennia, um, let them speak. Don't take the center, you know, center stage. But if you can use your privilege to, you know, destroy the privilege that, you know, you have, then do so. <clears throat> For us, I mean, this sparked conversations uh, within San Jose that have been bubbling up for a long time, you know, obviously always existed, but in response to the George Floyd protests, we had uh, an immense amount of use of force and arrests of legal observers, of reporters uh, by San Jose Police Department that continued to, you know, push the conversation into City Hall and more recently have made national news with, uh, I would say, secret uh, private Facebook group of San Jose police officers that had come out making, you know, explicit racist comments, Black lives do not matter. Um, I would use that woman's hijab as a noose. Uh, and so us through our campaign have called for, you know, increased powers to our independent police auditor, have asked them specifically to investigate, you know, Facebook and the use of Facebook for um, our officers as a way to understand which 
have explicit racist tendencies. And then shift the focus in the campaign as well to kind of as Anne said, the, the intersection of health and racial justice in our community, the intersection of systematic racism in San Jose is a city that is historically more, you know, white and Latinx than, you know, black, but we still have, you know, disproportionate arrests, uh, issues of homelessness uh, that hit our, our communities of color the hardest. And until we invest in the root causes of those issues and get everyone on square footing, we're going to continue to have these problems. And it's something the campaign is really pushing forward on. I would say, of course, uh, Black Lives Matter and Salt Lake County has a long way to go in order to uh, progress that movement. Uh, we currently have a law in effect um, that is very restrictive for individual cities and municipalities to have uh, citizen review or community oversight boards. And so the county can do a lot to uh, negate that and even do a countywide uh, commission uh, board in order to have direct community control over our police departments. Um, we also have had a lot of empty promises from local politicians about um, defunding the police and finding that, you know, dropping it by like 2% or something that's rather insulting, frankly. And Salt Lake is not just a, <clears throat> a timid, um, little place, uh, a conservative place in the Midwest. In fact, there's a lot of um, support right now for the Black Lives Movement. Um, there is a, a Justice for Bernardo campaign going on right now. A, a young man was, was shot dozens of times by the police and our district attorney, Sim Gill, just came out with saying that uh, he felt that that brutality um, and that murder was justified. And so even last night, uh, there were uh, windows broken at the uh, attorney's office and there was a whole uh, bunch of uh, paint being uh, red paint on the streets. And like, so people are very upset here, uh, rightfully so. And we need to uh, put our actions where our, our words are and not just have empty promises. Um, defund uh, the police in meaningful ways. We need to decriminalize drugs and see them as the social, uh, the mental health problems that they are um, and, and really come from a place of compassion and care for people. And we need to stop sticking our police department on things like mental health calls and, um, and, and things that they're not necessarily needing to be a part of. It's an, it's an unfair uh, drain on the police department. It's an ineffective way uh, to create uh, social and, and cultural cohesion. So um, as Salt Lake County Mayor, there's a lot um, that I could do to progress that, uh, much more so than our um, incumbent uh, candidate. Well, I want to thank you all for this. This will wrap up our uh, press conference for the local and state candidates. And I want to thank you all for your inspiring platforms and your words and your response to the, to the questions. Thanks everybody else who was here viewing this now and to those who will be viewing this in the future. Um, I want to thank all the candidates for your good timing as well as your great words. And Holly, Holly Hart the, in the Green Party Media Room for doing the organizing of these press conferences. Let's see, I think that's it. So I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Just remind people we have another press conference coming up at one o'clock. This will be with Greens elected to office and then another one at two o'clock for more Greens running for federal office. So thank you all for coming and uh, good luck with your races. We hope thank to see you. good news in the fall. Appreciate it. Thank you.